Hello friends, how are you? I'm Ari Thirger and today I'm going to talk about Baldr, one of the most important gods in the Norse myths, whose life and death takes a central role in Germanic mythology and religious perceptions. But before we start, I think it's important to explore this god's connection uh, with Thir, whom I have mentioned previously on another video, and I've explained that Baldr is the son of Thir and not of Odin. And I would like to explore that uh, relation between these two deities, because if you keep that in mind, everything else in the Norse mythology will, uh, concerning Baldr will make absolute sense. The name Baldr might come from Indo-European root Baal, which means white. And in this sense, we understand the connection of Baldr with light, often being characterized as a god of light, so fair that illumination comes from him. He shines. However, Baldr seems to derive from Baildor, which in Old High German would be Baldr, which means Lord. As I've said before on another video, the god Thir and his continental Germanic predecessor Thiwas both mean God, the God or Lord. Thiwas and Thir are the sun god, the solar deity, the father of the gods, the king of the skies, which rules over mankind. Thir is the singular form of Thivar which means gods. Baldr in runes would be pronounced Baldir or Baldir, which means new or renewed god or lord. In the sense that when Thir dies, the lord, Baldir will take his place, the new or renewed god. The father falls and the son takes his place, continuing his father's work and ruling over all. What you may find in the myths, most certainly, is that Thir is the son of Odin, but this is only mentioned by Snorre Sturluson in the Prose Edda. This is never attested anywhere else. This is a creation from Snorre himself. Thir was the great solar deity, and Baldr is his son, because if you think about it, Thir being the personification of the sun, Baldr being his child, is the personification of the light emanating from the sun. Hence, the reason why Baldr is described as being the shining one, the god of light and illumination, because he is the rays of the sun, the light that comes from the sun. He is the light that comes from fear, which sends down to earth his own sun, his own rays to illuminate the world which is why Baldr is described as being a bright light and everybody loves him. Think about uh, in Northern Hemisphere standards, especially further northwards, the importance of the sun for communities living in regions that most part of the year are deprived from light, long dark winters and the coming of the sun and its light is a blessing and something to praise and celebrate. So, of course, everyone loved Baldr, the god of light and the shining one, because he is the giver of light, he is the illumination of Thir, the solar god. Furthermore, in Germanic myths, the sun is chased by a wolf that will eventually devour it and the world falls into everlasting darkness, marking the beginning of the end of a cycle. Thir gets his hand bitten off by the great wolf Fenrir, which doesn't only reflect the Indo-European sense of justice, the loss of a hand for breaking an oath, but as I have stated before, Thir losing his hand signifies that he loses his sun hand, his solar hand. Since he is the god of the sky, one hand represents the sun and the other 
hand might represent the moon. The sun is devoured by a wolf and Tyr's hand that holds the sun is bitten off by a wolf. So this is a good indicator of the remnants of Tyr being a solar deity, the sky god. Also, during Ragnarok, Tyr is killed by the wolf Garmr, which might be the remnants of an older myth of the wolf devouring the sun. But I suspect this last one was Snorri attempting to equalize the fight between Tyr and Garmr with the Greek myth of Kerberos, capturing Hercules. Snorri in Prose Addis uh, starts explaining the origins of the gods coming from the east, from Asia, uh, the descendants of Trojan heroes, etc. Snorri was familiarized with classical literature. Mind that classical literature already Christianized. So he picks works of literature of great relevance during his time and composes his own version of the Norse myths, greatly Christianized as well. In an attempt to speak about the Norse gods, but in a way that fits into the religious mindset of his own time. So creating this myth of the fight between Garbre and Thyr seems very similar to Kerberos and Hercules, since Snorre states that Garbre is the wolf or hound that guards the gates of hell, just like Kerberos guards the entrance to the underworld in the Greek myths. And Snorre equalizes Odin with the Christian god, giving to Odin the role of Thyr as king of the gods, and Thyr was solely left with his role as a god of war, just like Hercules was later on praised as a god of war and strength, greatly worshipped by soldiers, especially later on by Roman soldiers. But on another point, the loss of Thyr's hand might also signify the death of Baldr. Baldr has a brother named Hodr. Both of them are twins, and these two mythological characters are the vestiges of a proto-Indo-European past of the twin brothers of the sky, children of the sun. But we will get to there later, later on. Since Baldr and Hodr are twins, they represent the left and the right hand or side of Thyr, the solar deity. Baldr dies, Thyr loses one of his hands, which is probably the right hand, while Hodr represents the left hand. This could be an explanation that helps us understanding the connection between Baldr and Thyr. And this may be why Hodr is regarded by some as a god of darkness and of the moon, and being labeled a blind god might be the darkness of the night. But I'm not very much inclined to this last point. As we shall see further ahead on this video, Baldr and Haldr are twin brothers, both being the sons of the sky deity. Therefore, both are gods of light and the personification of the illumination of the sun. And Holder's blindness is not real blindness, but a metaphorical blindness. Not related to darkness or the night and the moon, but a blindness related to lack of knowledge of certain events, being kept in the dark. This blindness was a fail in translation, I believe, but we shall get to that. Uh, don't worry. I shall explain that further ahead we shall understand this twin relationship between Baldr and Hodr, and also I shall explain the metaphorical blindness of Hodr. All this to tell you that if we keep in mind that Baldr is the son of Thyr, or rather Baldr is the illumination of the sun, everything else in the Norse myths makes absolute sense why the sun is devoured and there is no more light in the world, uh, why Thyr is devoured by a wolf, which is the representation of darkness and chaos, and why Baldr dies and there is no more light, 
and why in the end of Ragnarok, why in the end of a cycle, Baldur returns and becomes the new king of the gods. The return of the sun and illumination upon the world. The personification of the end of winter and the coming of brighter days, bringing renewal and rejuvenation. Baldur's death and resurrection symbolizes the summer solstice. As I've said, when the father falls, Thir, the sun will rise and take his place, Bal Thir. Christians were responsible for mixing up Thir and Odin, and this entire story of Baldur being the son of Odin, because the church equalized Odin with God. And since Baldr, like Christ, dies and resurrects during Ragnarok, which Snorri equalized with the Apocalypse, Baldr became the son of Odin, creating parallels to fit into the religious mindset of Snorri's time. The idea of the dying and resurrecting God is a very old idea. It's not something exclusive from Christianity. So, in order to explain the Norse myths during the Middle Ages, there was the need to create parallels with the main religion of the time, Christianity, which by itself contains many mythological pagan understandings in its early construction. So, it's easy to see and create similarities. Some people have suggested that because the Norse myths have so many religious similarities with Christianity, the medieval Scandinavians might have borrowed religious ideas from Christianized England during the Viking period. But the truth is, it was the other way around. Not Christianity borrowing religious ideas exclusively and solely from Scandinavians, but the creation of Christianity in great part is a Roman invention. Therefore, many pagan understandings which come from a proto-Indo-European past were placed into Christianity itself. Religious understandings shared by hundreds of Indo-European groups that eventually created many cultural ramifications and the religious similarities became obvious. Because once upon a time it was all one big religious understanding, more or less. Anyway, Baldr is the illumination of the sun. It's no coincidence that the flower sea mayweed and other types of mayweed, a sort of daisy, are known in Iceland, Norway and Sweden as Baldursbrå. Baldur's eyelashes. Baldursbrå grows wild in Iceland, for instance, always close to the sea and the, the sandy coast. It reminds us of the rays of the sun, flowering and giving beauty, connected to the myth of Baldur as a sun god, or rather as the son of the sun god Thir. So who was Baldr or Baldur? He was a god regarded as shining, illumination coming from him. He was loved by all the gods. He was very handsome, gracious, and in his presence there was happiness. It was quite cheerful. So wondrous was his presence that he transmitted light. But what he, he, real, he really is famous for in Scandinavian myths is for his dreams, his death and his resurrection. But overall, Baldr is the protector of the sun, the promoter of cosmic goodness, fairness, righteousness, purity and beauty. He was the light of the gods, which gave hope. His death marks the beginning of the end of a cycle. His death marks the end of the gods. All hope faded, goodness, fairness and purity gone. With his death there is no more light in the world of the gods. And so his death unleashes a sequence of events that will eventually lead to Ragnarok. 
not the twilight of the gods, as it is often stated, but to the doom of the gods, to the end of the world, the end of a cycle, so that everything might come again, a new world, a new creation, a new cycle of existence, and Baldr resurrects by the end of Ragnarok precisely to be the new god, the renewed lord, to be the chief figure that will be the guidance in this new cycle and the protector of new existence, new life. Being responsible for maintaining life, since he is the personification of the light of the sun. But before Baldr became the god we know of from Norse mythology, the myths surrounding this deity comes from a proto-Indo-European past. If Mr. Thomas from Survive the Jive is watching, I'm sure he will agree with, with me on my next assessment. When I say Indo-European, I'm not referring to, in this case, to a language, family or a specific culture, but rather to a category in comparative mythology and religious studies. Baldr and his brother Hodr, they seem to descend from the Indo-European twin gods, brother deities. Indo-Iranian and Vedic accounts might give us some clues about the origins of Baldr's myth. Now, pay close attention to the descriptions. If you are familiar with the myth of Baldr, you will immediately catch the similarities. In Vedic myths, the god Vivasvat, also known as Surya, is the sun, the solar deity, who had two handsome twin sons. One was the guardian of peace and the reconciliation, and the other was a mighty warrior who fought many demons and lastly was overcome by magic. And this twin brother came under the influence of a female demon that enchanted him and together with another male figure arranged that the warrior twin would kill his peaceful brother. The murdered brother descended to the other world and became a ruler there, in a place whose inhabitants shall repopulate the earth when the renewal of the world is completed. The, the twin who committed the killing was himself murdered and also descended to the underworld where in deep sleep awaits the last battle against the forces of evil. Another account, this one Indo-Iranian, the twin brothers Urvakshaya and Karesispa. Urvakshaya is a ruler and guardian. He is just and fair, an example of righteousness. His twin brother, Karesispa, is a renowned warrior, young and handsome, a great hero who fought many demons. He was a great archer, and just like in the previous account that I haven't mentioned, these two twins loved one another. There was strong friendship and brotherhood between them. But Karesespa was taken by trickery. The prince of evil created a sorceress named Knathaiti. She attached herself to Karesespa, and so he came under her influence. He became a pawn in the service of darkness and evil and so he ended up killing his twin brother. With the death of his brother, the spell was broken, and he sought vengeance to kill the demon that provoked the death of his twin, a demon named Ithaspa. These twin brothers can also be compared to the Osfins in Hindu myths. The Dioscori, to the Greeks, and later on to the Romans as well, and the Alkis among the Germanic Swabians, the Swabi. Twin deities, guardians of the sun, keeping wolves away. Keeping the sun safe from wolves. But concerning Germanic gods mentioned by Tacitus, he recorded twin brothers whom he compared to the Discori. 
he said that the Germanic peoples of Western Germanic regions worshipped in a grove the twin brothers whom he compares to Castor and Pollux, two twin brothers from the Greco-Roman mythology. What is important to retain here is that there is a long process of evolution of this myth of the twins and due to the influence of evil, darkness and chaotic forces using dark magic, the warrior twin ends up killing the other twin who is the representation of fairness, righteousness, justice and goodness. Proto-Indo-European and Indo-European myths that reached our days and can be seen in many cultures and in the Norse myths as well, in the myth of Baldr and Aldr, the twin brothers. Now, um, I have given you a few examples of Indo-European myths and I hope you remember the accounts because now we shall jump to the Norse myths concerning Baldr and Holder. The myth of the death of Baldr starts with his nightmares. Baldr at some point has horrible dreams. He had premonitions of his death. Death was coming to him and he would eventually die. The gods were aware of his terrible dreams, so the Haesir decided to protect him from harm. The father of Baldr, who in Snorri's myths becomes Odin, rode down to the underworld on his steed Sleipnir to consult a dead Cirrus, a Volva, who knew much of the world, about the past, the present and the future. Odin sees that in the underworld everything is prepared for a great feast, a magnificent feast. Odin woke the Cirrus and questioned her concerning this festivity and she answered that the guest of honor was to be none other than Baldur, his son. The dead Cirrus tells Odin everything he wants to know concerning his son's doom. Everything that was uh, prophesied by the dead Cirrus would come to pass. So Odin returned to Asgard and tells the gods about his encounter with the dead Volva. Frigg, who is the mother of Baldr, is regarded as a sorceress and gifted with foresight. And she took on the role to go to every animate and inanimate things and ask them to swear an oath that they would never hurt her son Baldr. Everything and every creature swore this oath and so Baldr was made immune to virtually everything. Being immune to harm, nothing could ever kill him. The gods thereafter uh, amused themselves with throwing and shooting at Baldr all sorts of things because he was immune which gave a sense of security to the gods. The light of Baldr would never fade, and so the gods were safe. This is when Loki enters the scene. He dislikes the fact that nothing can hurt Baldr. It's, it's just not natural. The gods are pretentious, and in their arrogance they think they can prevent death itself prevent the natural cycle of all things. Loki is disgusted by the action of the gods. So, disguised as an old woman, Loki went to Frigg to ask her about the oaths swore by everything and every being. And Loki learns from Frigg that she had not taken an oath from a small sapling of mistletoe because she thought it was too young to demand an oath from. Not just a random sapling of mistletoe, but one specific that was growing in the West. Loki located this mistletoe, 
Uh, in some accounts he made a spear out of it, in other accounts he made an arrow. And then he goes to the blind god Hodr, who is taking part on the games of throwing things to Baldr, at Baldr. Loki tricks the blind god into shooting the spear or arrow towards his twin brother Baldr, pointing Hodr in the right direction since supposedly he is a blind. Hodr throws the mistletoe weapon and since this mistletoe never took the oath to never harm Baldr, Baldr dies, killed by his own twin brother. The gods are completely petrified with fear because they know this is the first event that marks the beginning of the end, as it was prophesied by the dead Cirrus. The death of Baldr marks the unleashing of a sequence of events that will eventually bring the downfall of the gods. It will lead to Ragnarok. On top of that, they just lost the light of their world, Baldr. They lost illumination, all hope faded. The death of Baldr is a metaphor for the coming darkness and the long winter, the Fimbul winter, which marks the first stages of darkness before Ragnarok. This is the myth of the ending of a season, the coming of winter, and then with the resurrection of Baldr after Ragnarok, it marks the winter solstice until the summer solstice and the absolute radiance of the sun. From this myth, we can clearly see the similarities with the proto-Indo-European accounts I have mentioned previously. So, we have the twin brothers. Uh, one is fair and righteous and just promoter of peace and goodness and purity, while the other is the warrior and sportsman, an archer. Although in the Norse myths, Holder is regarded as simply being a blind god. On Saxo Grammaticus accounts of the same myth, Holder is regarded as being a great warrior. So that account is closer to the Indo-European myths of the twin brothers, but we shall get to that. So, we clearly have one brother killing another. The warrior twin tricked by a male figure, regarded as evil or ca a chaotic being, worker of darkness and evil magic, etc. But what Snorri's account is missing is the female figure, the sorceress or the female demon behind the grand scheme. Surely we have Loki disguised as an old woman uh, to get the information out of Frigg, but I think Snorri uh, in this account failed to see the bigger picture here or simply chose to take out the female figure of relevance because he was a Christian <laughs> and so created an alternative. Loki disguised as an old woman. In the Norse myths, especially in older poems, it's absolutely everywhere, ever, everywhere if you know where to look and see beyond the metaphors that there is indeed a female powerful figure behind the grand scheme to bring the downfall of the gods. This female figure is the old Norse remnants of the Indo-European sorceress or female demon that influences one of the brothers into killing the other. And in the Norse myths, this event has great proportions. So the great mind behind all of this, I would say it was Gullveig. The Germanic mythology speaks about a peaceful time a golden age, when Jotunheim's powers were still quiet. There was nothing to interrupt the works of the gods and the shaping of the world, and everything was at peace. 
until at last the three, uh, three dangerous and chaotic Tulz maidens, often known as the Twice Reborn, Gulveig, Haid and Horboda, the three are the one and the same, came out of Jutunheimer and interfered in world affairs. When she came out and unleashed herself upon the world and the cosmos, misfortune after misfortune befell the gods. Baldr was the only thing that kept light and hope and the darkness at bay. And it was Gulveig, the great mind behind the scheme of the death of Baldr. Because as soon as he died, Fimbul Winter came and nothing could stop it. Nothing could stop the chain of events that would eventually lead to Ragnarok and the destruction of the world and the doom of the gods. Gulveig influenced Loki and I bet it was she who came disguised as an old woman to gather information out of Flick. Gulveig is the Old Norse equivalent of the Indo-European sorceress, dark goddess or female demon that influenced one twin brother into killing another. And for some unfortunate reason, Snorre decided to take Gulveig out of this major event in the Norse mythology, quite possibly due to his monotheistic religious background, or simply because he failed to understand this part, or perhaps this is the work of mis mistranslations. Fortunately, on other accounts of the Norse myths, mainly Old Norse poetry, Gulveig is still present. Snorre Sturluson is the only one that gives an extensive account of the death of Baldr, but there are many details that he simply did not include. But many other pieces of this account can be found in earlier Old Norse poetry. And archaeologically speaking, many details of the narrative are depicted on pieces of jewelry dating from even before the Viking Age. In golden medals from the Iron Age, I have demonstrated a few on, uh, on the video I've done about talismans, for instance. We must not forget that Snorri's work is almost a completely new version of the Norse myths. I haven't been completely fair with Snorri's work, always complaining about the Christianization of the Norse myths by his hands. But in Snorri's defense, he wasn't just a Christian in a society politically overpowered by the church, which forced him to Christianize the Norse myths. I think Snorri Sturluson had a genuine interest in the Norse myths and in preserving the cultural heritage of his, of his country. But 200 years before his time, Catholicism became the official religion of Iceland and the Norse gods were seen as demons. It's true. Before and after Snorri's time in Icelandic spells and magical charms, the gods are invoked in prayers and incantations as if they were demons. The Norse gods, after Christianization, were regarded as demons and were included in incantations alongside other demons from Judeo-Christian mythology. So, Snorri's work, even though greatly Christianized, was fundamental to demonstrate that the Norse gods were not demons. Because the main idea of his work was exactly that, to stop the idea of seeing the Norse gods as demons. So obviously, in order to do that, he had to create Christian parallels to better expose the myths. So I honestly think 
that the myth of Baldur's death created by Snorri still holds a lot of important information. However, it does not contain important details, but fortunate, fortunately they can be seen in other accounts. In Baldur's death, I think Snorri wanted to create a martyr figure out of Baldr, or simply to fit into the Christian myths of Cain and Abel, Cain killing his brother, or maybe simple, uh, simply out of ignorance, Snorri omitted fundamental elements of this myth, and creating that previous mess I have spoken about of Odin being the father of Baldr and not of Tyr, and trying to equalize Odin and Baldr with God and Christ, etc. But we must also take into consideration that Snorre was also translating accounts that come from the oral, tra oral tradition, from an Indo-European past, and obviously through time and from culture to culture, things change. He is translating accounts from Old Icelandic, which in turn um, comes from Old West Norse and Old Norse, and let's not forget that his own work was eventually translated to Latin. And in, in translations, a lot of the meaning of the words gets lost or misinterpreted, which is what happened to Hodr being blind, which I, which I shall talk about further ahead. But first, let's talk about Saxo Grammaticus' account of this myth and see other similarities with the Indo-European accounts that are missing from Snorri's accounts. Saxo Grammaticus, who was contemporaneous to Snorre, was a Danish historian, was a Christian and a cleric, and writing in Latin, he was clearly influenced by classical models. So keep that in mind. Also, his version of Baldr in his Gesta Donorum depicts this pagan deity not as a deity but as a hero. Saxo is famous for Christianizing the Norse myths and stripping away any suggestions of divinity because to him there was only one god. So his accounts of the Norse myths are turned into a very much classical way of telling the great deeds of legendary heroes. In Saxo Grammaticus Gesta Donorum, History of the Danes, third book, Nana, which in Snorri's accounts he is the wife of Baldr, in Saxos she is the cause of the argument between Balderos and Otheros, the Latinized names for Baldr and Hodr. In the account, Baldr goes to war with his nemesis, Hodr, over the end of the princess Nana. If Snorri gives us an account of a peaceful Baldr, Saxo gives us the opposite. He is a very warlike hero. At first, Baldr is defeated by Hodr, who wins Nana. After subsequent victories, which make Baldr the Danish king, Hodr uses magic, as we have seen in the Vedic myths that the warrior hero is overcome by demonic magic. In Saxos, Hodr uses magic to eventually stab Baldr with the only sword that can be fatal to him. Now, remember this little detail of the sword. Further ahead, we shall speak of it. But one quick note on Baldr being the Danish king. This was not Saxo's invention. This idea derives from an older tradition which associates Baldr with the Danish royal house in Leir, Denmark. But what is interesting is that in the Icelandic poem Björkomal, it mentions Baldr and speaks of Baldr's residence as being Breidablik which comes in the myths. And indeed, Baldr's residence has been found in Danish place names. And it's called Predablik, which is in fact near Leir. 
So Bolvar quite possibly is a mythical ancestor of the Danish royal family. An Indo-European myth transported to the royalty of Northern Continental Germania. Anyway, in Saxo's version, we see the missing links to the Indo-European myths concerning the twin brothers that Snorri didn't put in his own accounts. In Saxo's accounts, there is a more direct contact with magic used by Holbrun, although it, it's not clear, it's not certain from where or whom he got this magic from. And the female figure that influences the, the brother into slaying his twin is present here, but much romanticized by Saxo. The female figure here is Nana, and the love that they bear for her influences their minds and they go to war with each other. But this is typical in Saxo's accounts, portraying female figures as the cause of the misfortune of man, and even a pure thing such as love can be a bad influence of women upon man. Still, the female influence is there, uh, as we see in Indo-European myths, but less majestic and less clever in schemes. I still prefer the, the Gulvega account and she being the great mind behind the death of Baldr that will eventually lead to the downfall of the gods. Now let's talk a bit about Holder's blindness. Obviously on this video I'm not going to delve too much on Holder because I would like to make a video solely for this deity in, in the future. But I think this blindness is quite curious, especially concerning the death of his own brother. If we keep in mind Hodr is the Scandinavian remnants of Indo-European myths concerning the warrior twin and magnificent sportsman and archer, it's a bit strange Snorri Sturluson portraying him as a blind god. And this wrong portrayal influenced modern heathens into describing him as a god of the moon and darkness, when originally he was the twin brother of Baldr, therefore also a god of light, son of the solar king of the sky. In Snorri's version, Hodr is helped by Loki into aiming the bow into the correct direction to kill his brother. But taking into account Saxo's version of the myth, Holder and Baldr are enemies and Holder is influenced by magic just like in the Vedic and Indo-Iranian myths. So it's hard to believe that Snorre simply forgot about Holder and his amazing skills as an archer and hunter and simply turns him into a blind fool that is easily tricked while on his right mind without the influence of magic. I think, once again, this was another of Snorri's inventions to fit into the story that he, he himself was already making alterations to create Christian parallels. Snorri placed Thir completely aside as being the real father of Baldr, so that Baldr could be the son of Odin, since Snorri portrays Odin not as a god of death, but the old father, because Snorri portrays Baldr as Christ, N not, just, uh, not just because of his resurrection after Ragnarok, but he portrays Baldr as a good god, giver of light, which in many other versions he is not that good and righteous and peaceful, since he is, he is also a warrior at war with his own brother. In the Christian mythology, when Christ is crucified, he is pierced by the blind Longinus, which is the name given to the blind Roman soldier who finally kills him with the spear. And here you have the Christian parallel. Christ being stabbed with a spear by a blind man 
and snow and, and so Snorri portrays Hodr as a blind god stab stabbing with a mistletoe spear the god Baldr. Some people might argue that this blindness in Hodr was a mistranslation, uh, translation, translating the words too literally. It could be indeed, and this blindness means that Hodr was not aware of the grand scheme in which he was being involved, so he was kept in the dark or that he was completely unaware and put aside by the gods and does not know the true nature and dimension of the prophecies that had been told to Odin, etc. So this blindness is not physical, but metaphorically speaking. But the previous example with, uh, with Christian parallels between the blind Roman soldier that stabs Christ is more likely. A quick note on the mistletoe, since the little sucker plays a fundamental role in the myth. In the myth, the mistletoe is described as a thin, which is a twig. And as I have explained on the video about talismans in Norse witchcraft, a thin is also the term for a talismanic object made out of wood, often a twig or a branch, often with runic inscriptions. So indeed, it might be that this twig of mistletoe is a sort of talisman which in some older myth might have been carved with specific runes to cause harm. Hence the reason why an arrow or a spear made of this mistletoe contained runes capable of breaking the spell Frigg concocted to protect her son Baldr. Dark magic or evil magic and in this way we find parallels with the Indo-European accounts I have mentioned previously. But remember that in Saxo's account the weapon was a sword and this is quite interesting because the term Thane is often used as a kinning for a sword in various Old Norse myths, especially in Old Norse poetry. And you will find many swords, uh, many sword names that end precisely with the term Thane. And the Old Norse word for mistletoe is mistletane. So Frigg supposedly didn't take the oath from this sword. But I believe in this account we are in the presence of the animistic notion that objects could contain a soul, essence, which is why to many swords in pre-Christian Europe a name was given, precisely because by giving a name to the object that was animated with runic inscriptions, the sword gained personality. So I don't think it was Frigg that carelessly left this sapling of mistletoe forgotten and didn't take its oath. I think the sword itself refused the oath because it's an animated object that contains life of its own. And having runes carved, dark runes, evil runes, etc., its true purpose is indeed to kill Baldr. The reason why this sword was created was solely to kill Baldr and nothing more. So, in the myths, it wasn't an actual twig of mistletoe that killed Baldr, but a magical sword named mistletoe. Mistletoe. Let's be rational in this. This myth has its origins in an Indo-European past, but I doubt it was created during that time. I believe this myth is far older, far back into a more prehistoric past, most likely Paleolithic. Let me explain. The mistletoe, the actual plant, is too frail, too fragile to make an arrow out of it. You can't make a proper weapon from this type of wood. Any craftsman who works with wood will confirm this. However, the substance that comes from the mistletoe's leaves and berries is quite poisonous. 
There are many species of mistletoe, but the European ones are poisonous. Adults can survive the mistletoe's poison, but it provokes pain and vomiting, great agony. Children and animals die with this poison. Creatures with a more fragile organism without many biological defensive mechanisms. Now, we know Paleolithic hunters would use paralyzing poisons or even deadly poisons in small quantities in their arrows or spear points. Just a thin layer enough to kill or put the animal to sleep. And we have Harrow heads from the Paleolithic whose shape is precisely to make little wounds or cuts enough for the poisons to enter the bloodstream and catch the animal alive but sleeping. Mistletoe poison is deadly when it enters in contact with the bloodstream. And I think this myth with an arrow killing a god comes from the Paleolithic. A myth involving twin brothers. And as we know from the Indo-Iranian myths, the twin that commits the killing is a fine archer and hunter. So maybe that is it, using the poison of the mistletoe. Who shoots the mistletoe arrow at Balmer? Hodr, the archer of the gods and the one of the greatest hunters among the Heisir. Let's talk about Vali and Hermodre, who also have a part to play in this event. Let's start with Vali first. Vali is Baldur's Avenger in the account of the Edda. In Saxo's account, he is named Bos. In both traditions, Vali is the son of Rindra or Rinda, who Odin deceived through magic and took her by force. From this event, Vali was born with the sole purpose to kill Hodr and thus avenging Baldr's death. This is the only thing we know about Vali, that he was created and instructed to kill Hodr. In Saxo's account, Vali, as boss, is killed uh, as soon as he, is, he has taken revenge. In the poem Valfrugnismal, there is also a valley among the new generation of gods that will live on after Ragnarok. So it fits into the Indo-European accounts of the gods going, the twin gods going to the underworld to wait uh, the new age and those who live there will repopulate the world when the catastrophic event comes to an end. So since Baldr goes to the underworld and is a guest of honor there, it fits into the Indo-European myths that the murdered god will reign in the underworld until it's time to repopulate the world again alongside his twin brother. So it makes sense why Hodr dies and Vali after him, so they can be part of the new generation of gods as we have indication in Vavtrud Nismal that a valley will be among the new generation of deities. In Lokasena, there is the mention of a valley as being Loki's son, but this is the only account of it and nothing more is said. Both Odin, Odin and Loki have a son with the, the same name, it might be a mistranslation, but it's curious nonetheless, because as we shall see, Loki has an interesting role yet to play before the end. And he isn't solely a worker of evil, influenced or allied, allied with Gulveig. Still, Vali, being the avenger of Baldr, in some aspects fits into the Indo-European myths, since at least in the Indo-Iranian accounts after the magical enchantment is gone from the twin who committed the killing, he seeks vengeance. The twin brother has to die and accompany his brother into the underworld. So 
in the Norse myths, Vali plays the role of delivering death to Holder and send him to hell. But I cannot help to think that Vali might be more than just an avenger. Snorri places Vali as the son of Odin, but as I've explained previously, a lot of Tyr's attributes in Snorri's Edda were given to Odin, so that Odin could fit into the role of the Christian god. I suspect that Vali was originally another son of Tyr, the solar deity, making Vali a direct brother of the twin uh, the twins, Baldr and Holder. Snorri didn't take out that element, because Vali being the son of Odin and Odin the father of Baldr and Holder in the Edda, still makes Vali half-brother to the twins. But Thyr was also the god of justice. His son Baldr is also related to justice, as he is his son after him, for Seti, who comes to replace Baldr after he dies and becomes the god of justice as well. In the Indo-European myths, the equivalent of Baldr is regarded as a righteous god, um, a god of justice. And he is the son of the solar deity as well, so there seems to be a sense of justice in here and the gods of justice following the same lineage. So it makes a certain sense Vali being the son of Tyr and brother to the twins, and in a way he delivers justice for the killing of his own brother, by executing his other brother. The pre-Christian Norse had a great sense of justice, as we can study in various sources, and as, I've, as I have exposed on the video about Viking justice. And it wasn't uncommon justice by one's hands, when the cause is deemed righteous. The right of vengeance. Vali killing his brother in the name of justice is brotherly retaliation, which makes Vali another god of justice, following the lineage of his original father, Tyr, and not Odin. The same family of deities related to justice. Tyr, Vali, Baldr and Forseti. Vali is the personification of this sort of justice, outside the laws dictated by the thing, the assembly. Vali is the right of vengeance when a crime is committed that goes beyond the law, when it goes beyond justice and righteousness. A crime so terrible that only vengeance is capable of giving justice, because it, it is in a father's right to seek vengeance for the death of his own son by Indo-European perceptions of justice. Now, about Hermodra. Hermodra is a god that only appears in Snorri's account. Aside, aside from that, Hermodr appears once in Hindaljod, and it's a hero and not a god. And this is probably the source from where Snorri took the, the name Hermodr. In truth, aside from Snorri's account, not much is known about Hermodr. But in Snorri's account, it goes like this. Snorri says that Hermodr is the son of Odin and brother of Baldr, because to Snorri virtually every god was the son of Odin, since Odin in Snorri's accounts was equalized with the Christian god. And according to Snorri, Hermodr was willing to ride to hell, to the underworld, on Sleipnir's back to persuade the, god, the goddess Hell to release Baldr and his wife Nana. Hermodr rode nine nights until he reached the underworld. Hermodr saw that Baldr was sitting beside the goddess Hel, in a seat of honor. Hermodr explains to Hel the great sorrow that befell all living things and the gods when Baldr died, 
and so he pleaded with Hal to release his brother, so Joy could return to the world. So Hal made a deal. If everything in the cosmos weep for Baldr, she will release Baldr. But if anyone refuses to weep, then Baldr remains trapped in the underworld. Her mother rode back to Hosgard, told the gods about this arrangement, and the gods sent messengers to every corner of the cosmos. Everyone wept for the death of Baldr. Everyone except Thok, a giantess who was none other than Loki in disguise. Since Thok did not weep for Baldr, Baldr remained in the underworld. Now, let's try to break this a bit, shall we? Hermodr is Snorri's creation in this entire sense of being a messenger of the gods sent down to the underworld to try to rescue Baldr. In Old Norse poetry, as I have said, Hermodr appears but as a hero and not, and not much is said about him. In Havin's Erkodamol, uh, there is a her Hermodr, supposedly a mortal that greets the fallen heroes upon arriving to Valhall. But this entire story of Hermodr being the son of Odin and going to the underworld as a messenger of the gods and trying to rescue Baldr is Snorri's creation and sounds very familiar. <laughs> as we have seen, Snorri was familiarized with the Christianized classical myths. And you see classical mythology all over Snorri's accounts in the Prose Edda. In Greek mythology, Hermes, whose name is very similar to Hermodre, and Hermodre seems in fact to be the Old Norse name for Hermes, in the Greek myths, Hermes not only is the messenger of the Olympian gods, but he also asks Persephone hand in marriage, the goddess of the underworld. And in one of the Orphic hymns, uh, Gnothnius uh, is, is dictated to Hermes, indicating that he was also a god of the underworld, which might explain the Norse Hermodorus' easiness into entering the underworld as well. Snorre giving to Hermodor the indication that this god is connected to the dead, as we have on the account of Orkonomal, of, of Hermodor greeting the fallen heroes into Valhall. Furthermore, we have a very interesting Greek myth that I would like to quickly summarize and you will notice the similarities. For a year, the goddess Demeter, goddess of agriculture, harvest, fertility and sacred law, kept herself hidden away. No plants were growing around the world. The mortals were not able to eat or make sacrifices to the other gods. Everyone, mortal and god alike, were praying to Zeus to relieve their suffering, to make the meter favor the harvest once again. Zeus sent a messenger called Iris to deliver the message to the meter, uh, demanding her return at once, which she refused. Zeus then told the all the other gods to go to Demeter to talk her into allowing the seeds to grow once again. Each of them went to Demeter and begged her to return to work. One by one she refused them all, telling them she would not return to Olympus until she had her daughter Persephone. The king of the gods, Zeus, held Persephone. He knew he had no choice, so he sent Hermes to the underworld to bring his daughter home, Persephone. When Hermes arrived to return Persephone to Demeter, 
the truth came out. Persephone had consumed the food of the underworld, which made Persephone doomed to remain in the underworld for eternity. It had been Hades that supposedly tricked Persephone into eating the underworld food so she could remain there forever with him as husband and wife, just like Loki tricked the, the gods disguised as Tuck, and so Balder remained in the underworld. And in this, in this account, we have all the classical parallels we need to understand Snorri's creation of Hermodr, trying to rescue Balder from the underworld, so that a light could come into the world once again. Just like in the Greek myths, the, the absence of the meter didn't allow things to grow because the light of the sun is very much needed in agriculture. And we have her daughter, Persephone, being the underworld goddess, and Hermes trying to get her back and speaking with her, rescuing you, her, just like the event of her mother with Hell trying to retrieve Baldr. Zeus, Hermes, Demeter, Persephone and Hades. Odin, her mother, Baldr, Hell and Loki. But what I find intriguing in the Norse myths is actually Loki disguised as Thok and refusing to weep and so Baldr remains trapped in the underworld. At this point, I honestly think that Loki played his part with Gulveig, and now he, he was playing his part with Odin, as I, will, as I will explain next to finalize this video. At all costs, Baldr must remain in the underworld. Baldr really had to die and remain trapped in Hell until Ragnarok came to an end, so he can repopulate the world and guide the new generation of gods. Loki, throughout the myths, is a very cunning god, one of the most intelligent beings of the Norse myths. He is also creating all sorts of troubles but he is always the one to fix them, one way or another. Loki in the myths is also the key figure of change. He is always the one res responsible for creating trouble and chaos and fixing it. He is always the link between events, between chaos and order. This chaotic neutrality that makes everything move and change. Because in the world of the gods and in the cosmos itself, nothing changes unless Loki pushes that change and then he fixes what he has done, but everything changed forever and nothing is ever the same again. Loki plays his part in the death of Baldr, and as we will see, the death of Baldr is necessary. So now Loki, disguised as Tok, made sure that Baldr stayed in the underworld, possibly fixing his deeds with the necessary link between chaos and order. Because at all costs, by all means, Baldr must remain in the underworld. I think what is implied here is Loki working with Odin, which was a death god as well, but also the promoter of change. Odin makes the plans for the future, while Loki plays the role as the link between order and chaos, as the god that forces change, and that change is part of Odin's plans for the future. And this might explain why in the poem Loka Senna, Loki is regarded as being the blood brother of Odin, Probably in some older myths, Odin and Loki were the key figures of the cosmos that made everything move and everything evolve. Now, just because Thyr is the father of Baldr and not Odin, 
This doesn't take away Odin's accomplishments in this myth. Certainly, we already know that Snorri's version is always pushing to create parallels with Christian accounts. Odin lets his own son die, which perfectly fits into God letting his son, Jesus Christ, die in the cross. But if we take into consideration that Thyr is the actual father of Baldr, the vision of a father sacrificing his own son is less heavy. Tyr is a solar deity, so he cannot easily enter the underworld. Odin, on the other hand, is a death god. Odin is the only god that goes down to the underworld and hears about the prophecy. Quite possibly, he doesn't give out all the details to the gods and keeps secrets for himself, which is why he is also willing to sacrifice Balder because it's not his son. But, on the other hand, Baldr stands for the hope and purity and light in the realm of the gods, and Odin is willing to sacrifice that. He knows of the prophecy, and he knows nothing can be done to prevent Baldr's death. So, he just let it happen. Nothing can prevent Baldr's death. But I think even so, Odin has a plan. As I've said in the video about necromancy in Norse mythology, according to the Old Norse poems, Odin is the only one that can wake up the dead and speak with them. Odin and Freya. This is obvious because they are both death deities. Odin was a death god before Snorri turned him into the king of the gods and the old father, Ulfadir. So, o Odin goes down to the underworld, wakes up the dead Cirrus, and gets information out of her. He tells the gods about it, and Frigg, being regarded as a sorceress and gifted with foresight, as I have previously said, she obviously knows the future and what will happen. Both she and Odin know of the consequences and the inevitability of events. Baldr is going to die, which is why she didn't bother to take the oath from that mistletoe, because she and Odin knew of the prophecy and knew that that mistletoe would be the weapon that would kill Baldr. They actually done nothing to really prevent the inevitable. They accepted fate. In the poem Lokasena, for instance, when Loki is arguing and insulting and accusing the gods, a warning is given to him to be careful with what he says because Frigg knows the future of all, and to this assessment he gets frightened. Maybe Frigg knew Loki's role on the scheme to kill Baldr. The gods know about it. But here's the thing. The gods knew of Ragnarok, and it would be the death of Baldr that would unleash Ragnarok and the doom of the gods. The gods would die. But no matter the odds, no matter how dark things get, there is always a solution. Baldr's death was necessary, because upon his death he was sent down to the underworld and in there he remained protected from Ragnarok, which means he wasn't going to be destroyed by the catastrophic event. Baldr needed to die, so in the end he could resurrect and come out of the underworld which was the place that protected him. He was under the protection of the goddess Hel, so he could come back, and by his hands, existence could continue to, well, exist. <laughs> Baldr plays the key role in Norse mythology. He is the key figure that continues the cycle of existence, and another world, 
and another phase of life can continue, surpassing all darkness and evil schemes. Odin and Frigg were willing to sacrifice Baldr and let him die because he was the key figure that would play the major role after Ragnarok. He would ensure the continuation of the existence of, go of the gods themselves and all life. And upon Baldr's pyre, Odin speaks in whispers to Baldr. And no one knows the secret and it remains untold. But I bet it, ha it has to do so uh, something with this plan of keeping Baldr in the underworld to be safe from the destruction of Ragnarok. I think this is the moral of this myth, that no matter how dark things are, the sun will always shine tomorrow or the day after. It's certain that light will come again. Baldr's death is both the winter solstice and the summer solstice. He dies, there is a rebirth from darkness, and then he shines once again. This, this is paganism, celebrating and living accordingly with every different season of the year. Learn to live in harmony and adapt to the different seasons of the year. But we also mustn't forget the role of Gulveig in all of this. Her grand scheme to destroy the world of the gods and rob them of their light and hope. This gives us another moral, a darker one. Neither innocence nor vigilance, nor even the purest of things, serve as protection against evil and the natural chaotic forces of the universe that must exist as forces that, through great destruction and sorrow, can also create new life and the continuation of existence. Peace is never a permanent state of affairs. Where there is life and beauty, there is also death and ugliness. Where there is light, there is also darkness, which is no more than the shadows that derive from light itself. Order and chaos must always exist to create a cyclical balance so that life can continue to thrive. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. By far, it's the longest video I've ever done. If you have made it this far, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, of course, talk very well.